Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Elliot Cohen. I'm the Dean of SAIS, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2019 Rostov Lecture on International Affairs with General David Petraeus. Uh, before I introduce General Petraeus, I want to just share a little bit more about the Rostov Lecture Series at SAIS. Um, the, the series is named after Charles I. Rostov. It was established in 1990 by his wife, Dorothy, as a tribute to his life and to his abiding interest in international affairs. Um, Charles Rostov was a Hopkins alumnus and was a, a dedicated supporter of the university's efforts to improve our understanding of the world. And that, of course, is the SAIS mission. And we're particularly glad today that we have with us uh, Charles' daughter, Terry, and his son, Gene, and uh, his wife, Heather, uh, to be with us for this event. And I want to express my gratitude to you and to your family uh, for making it possible. So um, Dave Petraeus is one of those people who actually really literally does not need a whole lot of introduction. He's still going to get one, uh, but it's not going to be very long. Uh, he is currently, and has been since 2013, uh, affiliated with KKR. He is currently the chairman of the KKR Global Institute, which supports KKR's investment committees, portfolio companies, and partners with analysis of geopolitical and macroeconomic trends. But of course, what he's most known for is a career of 37 years service to this country in uh, the United States Army. Uh, to include command of the surge in Iraq, uh, command of Central Command, and then capping it all, service at the Central Intelligence Agency as uh, the director. Uh, it is an extraordinary career, not just of service, but of successful service to the United States. Um, what we're going to be doing tonight, uh, since General Petraeus and I met when he was a major and I was an assistant professor a long time ago, um, is not do this as a lecture, but rather to do it as a conversation. So I have a number of uh, questions that I would like to put to him. We'll have a conversation back and forth, and then we're going to open it up to you all. I'm going to say uh, from the outset that when the time comes for the Q&A, I will be selecting people who either are students or look so much like students that I can't tell them apart. <laughs> Uh, so they're going to get first uh, preference. But with no further ado, it's a great pleasure to have you again at SAIS. Dave, please join me. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I want to add my thanks to the Rostov family as well. Uh, I think I've actually done this once before, um, but it is a real pleasure to do it with uh, Elliot, this time being Dean Elliot Cohen, and I congratulate you on that. Thank you. Uh, we'll talk about strategic leadership later on. Uh, I think you've been an extraordinary leader of a variety of different strategic programs and others here over the years, but you are now truly a, the strategic leader for SICE, uh, and I think the school is in extraordinarily good hands. Uh, it is a pleasure to be back here as well. Uh, we go way, way back, uh, back to the days of Fuad Ajami and, and the other heroes. Uh, who are here over the years. Um, and again, uh, to those who are fortunate enough to be where you are in these seats as a student or a former student, I congratulate you in particular. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Dave, and thank you for your, your friendship and your, uh, your mentorship over the years, also, and also for your engagement with this institution. You've repeatedly visited us. You, had, you came and spoke to us uh, very shortly after you returned from command from your first command in Iraq with the 101st. Um, you even went on a staff ride with us to Gettysburg. That was before that. That was, when that was, was before then. Uh, Actually, that was when I was doing a fellowship in lieu of the War College, and I subsequently then did a deployment to Haiti in lieu of the fellowship. So I, there will be a recurring theme here, especially for the military fellows and military students here which is the enormous importance of what might be termed out of your intellectual comfort zone experiences. Uh, graduate school was very much uh, that kind of experience for me. I treasure it to this day. Uh, and again, those who are in uniform or actually from other uh, institutions where this might not be the norm, uh, where someone may have even told you as they told me that I was 
committing professional suicide by going to graduate school instead of the Ranger Regiment. Obviously, I seem to avoid that, but um, it's, it's really wonderful, and I, I encourage you to make the very most of it. And of course, we always think uh, just how much more successful you would have been if you'd gotten your PhD here rather than at Stanford. <laughs> I mean, at Princeton, sorry. Princeton, I get them confused. Um, Dave, let me ask you a question. Um, so you're at the, the I chairman. won't make any jokes about, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we won't the, go there. A whole series of Princeton yep. jokes that we can tell, you know. Thank God for Harvard, everybody can't get into Princeton and that kind of stuff, but anyway, <laughs> work with me here. Oh boy. <laughs> so you're the chairman of the KKR Global Institute, and um, you know, I was thinking about your career. I mean, there you were, director of the Central Intelligence Agency, privy to all of our secrets, and of course, you'd worked on the joint staff, and you've been a theater combatant commander and so many other things. Um, it always struck me when I dipped into government over the years how different the information flows are and how differently one sees the world from that perspective than from the outside. So what are the kinds of things that you think you will understand better now as a result of being where you are, and maybe you should explain what sure. KKR Global Institute does, sure. than, than you did when you were you know, there with all the resources of the U.S. government at your Disposal. Well, first of all, so the KKR Global Institute, which um, I created, does the geopolitical risk for KKR, and frankly, that's becoming ever more important. I mean, it used to be it's sort of a sidelight. We looked at that when we were in countries where we'd never invested before. It's become much more important uh, these days. We integrate the macroeconomic analysis from a terrific team that we have there as well, and then the environmental social governance issues analysis. Uh, which is also, it, any one of these actually can be a deal breaker. And we use what we gather in that to supplement what the deal team is doing. They're doing the financial analysis of it. Uh, we also have an innovation team that looks at how it might be disrupted by innovations down the road. Uh, and all of that comes together. We then essentially have three client groups. One are, is the investment committees. Uh, Americas, Asia, Europe, and then there's even a bunch of others now, real estate, energy, infrastructure, credit, next generation technology. Uh, it goes on and on. And just keep in mind, we've got somewhere somewhere between $205, $210 billion under management around the world. We own about 100 companies. And I've actually, maybe even more significant, I was made a partner uh, also about five years ago, mm. which is wonderful. And if you're ever offered a partnership in KKR, take it. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's really quite a wonderful thing. Um, and then second group of uh, clients, if you will, are the, our portfolio companies. Again, we own about 100 of these outright, and then we have uh, uh, minor stakes or less than majority stakes in another 50 to 70, something like that. Um, they often are grappling with issues. Uh, you know, we did a $2 billion investment in telecommunications in the former Yugoslavia. Every single country was problematic, and in every single case, and so one of my people would be on the board. You, pull me in as needed. Uh, we'd multiple trips to these countries, and we'd go in with the U.S. ambassador, because it's a U.S. company, uh, although it's all around the world, and then the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development on the other hand, and we'd go in and sit with government officials and explain to them that their competition council head was actually anti-competition count and in the grip of a political party and not allowing our great firm to uh, do what we were going, planning to do to improve uh, internet ac access and a variety of other telecoms for them. Again, this is not unique. We've done this, again, all around the world. Uh, and that has been very important. Co companies that want to go global, we can help them uh, in many cases. Uh, so and in a number of cases where we have not invested before, and key examples would be Mexico, uh, the Balkans, uh, Ethiopia, Philippines and a handful of others. We just, there were headline risks as we called it. And so the team and I will go in and evaluate it and then come back and we have to give thumbs up uh, before we're willing to do an investment in those cases. I've actually vetoed a couple of uh, investments. One in, was really attractive in particular back in the old Middle East uh, area of responsibility and there was some reputational risk that I won't go into that was just too, too much despite how attractive it was financially. So that has been great fun. And then uh, our investor groups, uh, particularly our strategic investors, as we call them, these are the ones, the very substantial 
uh, they all want to understand the world in which we're all investing together. And so we do a lot of activity with them, uh, almost similar to what we're doing here, but again with, say, their board or their stakeholders or whatever it may be. It, it, you know, it's wonderful, frankly, to get paid to do what you love to do. I mean, look, I left government. What I really wanted was intellectual stimulation. I still, I travel a great deal. Boots on the ground still matter, usually about 25 countries a year. Some of them many more than one time. Uh, the UK so, were in the world. So does the world look different from this vantage point than it did from within government? Well, or? it's a different perspective. Don't get me wrong. We're still concerned about security issues. We're still concerned about national security issues, uh, uh, geopolitical risk, again, and all the rest of this, all of which you did as the director of the CIA, but with less of a national security focus and more of, obviously, a financial investment it, focus. Do you ever run across things uh, or insights or views where you say, gosh, I wish I had known that when I was at CIA or, for that matter, CENTCOM? Well, sure. I, you know, and again, it has to do with in-depth knowledge of a particular country or particular, actually, even industry or development. Obviously, the world has turned over a considerable amount in the yeah. seven years since I was in government as well, and we'll talk about some of the most significant developments. <laughs> Uh, but again, I think geopolitics has actually become vastly more important than it was even yeah. when I left government. And don't get me wrong, there were plenty of challenges. But in particular, we'll come back to this theme again and again, the rise of China and the fact that China is not just our biggest geopolitical competitor, it's also, or was until the tariffs, our biggest trading partner. And we'll come back more and more on this yeah. because that's the most important relationship in the world by far, bar none. And it is, as I think a previous Secretary of Defense said, all China all the time in a lot of different respects. So and we're um, the biggest we're, investor of our type in China, in Japan, in India, and in Asia writ large. So we'll get to China, but first, uh, breaking news. Um, President Trump has announced that we're uh, withdrawing American forces from Syria, particularly from the, and I believe actually the news reports I saw said that some of the military outposts along the Syrian-Turkish border had already been, American posts, had already been evacuated. Uh, so this is a part of the world, obviously, you know very well indeed that uh, you've served in for quite a long time. W what am I supposed to think? Well, I've been, the, the press still has my email uh, and phone number, and uh, my reaction, frankly, was to share the concerns that had been voiced by Majority Leader McConnell, Senator Lindsey Graham, both normally strong allies of the president in a variety of different ways, uh, former U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Nikki Haley, and among a bunch of others. Now, I say that with a caveat because it is still not precisely clear to me what it is that w the policy objectives are, uh, nor specifically what the policy is. You know, in other words, how deep is Turkey going to be allowed to go? How big a buffer is this? What do they intend to do with that buffer? I mean, if they're going to move millions of refugees in who are in refugee camps in Turkey right now. Which is what they, uh, they say. They, certainly they one say. of their objectives, yeah. it appears, in addition to just having some kind of zone of separation between the Syrian Kurds mm -hmm. and the uh, Turkish Kurds, um, that could be quite disruptive. Uh, but again, without the real specifics, and I'm not aware of those being reported uh, at this time, uh, I have uh, significant reservations about that. By the way, the DOD has actually put out a press release I was literally reading on the way here, uh, which seemed, did not offer further clarification, actually. <laughs> uh, it seemed to be warning the Turks, uh, as the president did in one of those tweets along the way as well. So again, without some real specificity on that particular policy initiative, it's very hard to evaluate what the implications are. But among the implications, in addition to, again, displacing some people and replacing them with others, uh, could be that our partners, the Syrian Kurds, who have fought and died in many, in large numbers, to defeat the Islamic State and eliminate the caliphate, noting that there are probably 30,000, are the usual estimates used, of Islamic State forces that are still in and around the Iraq and, and Syria area. Uh, but those Kurds may take their eyes off the remnants of ISIS, which are trying to regroup, trying to establish a, a, uh, an insurgency and carry out terrorist activities, um, and also may take their eye off or have to take their eye off these very large camps of 
uh, family members of the Islamic State fighters. So the one most significant is the one that is up to 70,000 family members, mostly wives of and then their children uh, of Islamic State fighters at Al Hall. Um, and that is a huge challenge. Uh, this is a big conundrum uh, because countries are not, most of these came to Syria uh, from another country, and the countries, perhaps understandably, but not helpfully, uh, are pretty reluctant to take them back if indeed they will at all. So again, there's a lot of unfinished business here. Uh, one of the lessons I think we have learned, I'll go into the five big lessons we should have learned from the last 18 years of war, but one of them is, you know, you don't take your eye off this ball. Um, if, you, if you do that, they can, defeat implies that they cannot accomplish their mission without being reconstituted. Well, as we saw in Iraq, if you take your eye off Al-Qaeda in Iraq, the next thing you know, they've reconstituted themselves as ISIS and drifted into Syria, gained a lot of power in their back. So it seems to me you know, th uh, there are two different kinds of arguments, uh, even in the, just this past, in, during the afternoon, as people have argued this out, about why this is a bad idea. One is the one that you've laid out, which is uh, you take the, your eye off the ball, ISIS comes back, there is uh, destabilized in a variety of ways. Well, there's also something about a commitment of the United States. Well, that, to that's partners. what I was going to say. Mean, that, that's you know, another factor so here you, with you, that question. I, and I want to draw you so, out a little bit on yeah. that because uh, you know you mentioned earlier on talking about KKR facing reputational risk. Yep. Um, how important a consideration should be America's reputational risk? And the reason why I ask that is I think it's fair to say that the president. Uh, one of the things that makes this president unusual is he doesn't really think that reputational risk, in the sense we've just been using it, matters a whole heck of a lot. That is to say, um, reputation for you know, fidelity, for a certain kind of commitment to allies, to following through, to staying the course, all those sorts of things. You know, if you were to make the case for reputation, how would you make it? Well, it's by no means unique to this administration. Uh, you, we can go back to the previous administration. We had a red line that turned out not to be a red line. That is quite serious. And the Prime Minister of Singapore, I remember telling me, he said, you know, that doesn't just have ramifications in the Middle East yep. and Europe. Uh, that has significant ramifications out here. Uh, there were, we have more than occasionally had more expansive rhetoric than it turned out we were willing to to actually see through to conclusion. Bashar al-Assad must go. That's a pretty substantial statement made by the superpower of yep. the world. Uh, and again, we did not make him go. Uh, we didn't even have a safe zone, much less uh, uh, other initiatives. Um, we perhaps could have been firmer with Russia uh, at various times. Perhaps so with uh, with China on some issues as well, while certainly seeking to coordinate with them, to collaborate, to try to have a mutually beneficial relationship. But at times, and by the way, I would go back with respect to the administration that you and I both, I also served the previous administration, yeah. but the one yeah. that you and I served in together, um, where there were opportunities. Now there's a lot of revisionist history about the relationship and those sort of early post uh, WTO days for China um, and opportunities that might have sent messages uh, yeah. very early on about subsidies not being allowed and intellectual property transfer and theft and all these other issues. Uh, this again, is, again this there was is, a shrinking from that. And but, but this is a narrower kind of reputational risk that I'd like to just hear you say a few, few more words about, and that is the risk that you incur when you walk away from a, an ally like the Kurds. And the argument would be, well, they're pretty imperfect and their connections with the PKK and so on. But it, if I understood you correctly, you think that there's something almost in the nature of a moral commitment that we have to them. Is that correct? Yeah, look, I think, and it's not just to them. I think we have that to some other partners with whom we've been fighting, particularly uh, in the wars of the post-9-11 yeah. period. Again, you've got to be sort of coldly, this is the home of realist thinking, after all. I mean, this is Paul Nitz's 
uh, he was your first dean, I guess, wasn't he? Uh, well, he's, he was one of the co-founders with Christian yeah. Herter, okay. who, who was a somewhat different character. He was, but but again, we all associate Paul Nitza. It is the yes. Nitza courtyard in which you disembark. Yep. You walk through the Nitza, this and that. Yep. So, uh, and again, I think known for a realistic appraisal of uh, yep. international relations and, and security situations. Uh, so I think you've got to be fairly you know, clear-eyed about that. And you have to be very careful, I think, with your rhetoric. I think that's really the issue yep. at heart here, that if you do make a public commitment and you are the superpower, um, you, you need to follow through with that commitment, unless there's some explanation about why the context has changed and all the rest of this. So, but so, be measured in what you do. And we have repeatedly uh, in the post-9-11 period, I would argue with every one of the three post-9-11 administrations, had considerably more expansive rhetoric uh, than it turned out we were willing to actually put up. So, so let me use that uh, <clears throat> transition to the question of the lessons, if you think there are uh, any that we should take away from what some people call the forever wars, yep. Iraq, Afghanistan, yep. and the, the broader and more diffuse conflict against Al-Qaeda and analogous um, movements. Uh, you indicated that you thought there were five big takeaways, yeah. so why don't you tell us what they sure. are? Sure, sure, and I'd be happy to go into details on some of the specifics of Afghanistan, Iraq, the catastrophically <laughs> bad decisions we made in the first few months in Iraq and that kind of thing if we want to get into that later. But I think, you know, what you, what a strategic leader has to do, do uh, and you are the one on the stage at this point in time, by the way, not me, um, <laughs> You have to get the big ideas right. Again, strategic leaders have four tasks, and it's that first task that is unique to a strategic leader. There's usually only one in an organization unless you have co-heads, co-CEOs, as co-founders as KKR does. Um, the, that task is to get the big ideas right. And if you don't get the big ideas right, everything else is building on a shaky intellectual foundation. Um, the fact is that I often have noted that the surge in Iraq that mattered most wasn't the surge of forces, the 25, 30,000 additional forces, it was a surge of ideas, which the big ideas were 180 degrees different from what we were doing prior to the surge. So this is a fairly transformative a moment of change leadership, as they say, uh, to go from consolidating on big bases to living with the people, because that's the only way you could secure them, to handing off to the Iraqis to taking it back. Uh, to releasing detainees, to stopping releasing them until you get the extremists out of their midst and have a rehabilitation program and a variety of other initiatives, sort of tolerating reconciliation to embracing it wholeheartedly, uh, and then more determinedly, just very, very uh, huge increase in the intensity of the operations to get the irreconcilables. These are the big ideas. So you've got to get the big ideas right. By the way, you didn't have to communicate them, oversee the implementation, then have a formal mechanism where you sit down, force yourself to determine how to refine them, and do it again and again and again. I can give you lots of examples, including that. I'm going to come back which to is strategic a great leadership one. at the end. But, but to talk about, I think the big ideas that have emerged from the past 18 years of, of war, continuous war, are as follows. Number one is that Islamist extremists will exploit ungoverned spaces in the Muslim world. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when and how bad is it. Number two is you actually have to do something about it. This is not a problem that you can study until it goes away. Uh, you can't engage in paralysis by analysis. It doesn't go away. And moreover, Las Vegas rules do not apply in these areas. What happens there doesn't stay there. They tend to spew violence, instability, uh, extremism and a tsunami of refugees, not just into neighboring countries, but as in the case of Syria or Libya or even some of the others, all the way into Western Europe, causing the greatest populist challenges since the end of the Cold War. So you do have to do something. Number three is the U.S. generally has to lead, but we want to have as big a coalition as we can, as we can get, uh, and that coalition should include Muslim countries for whom this is an, ex this is an existential struggle. Uh, not, not something less than that. Uh, but the U.S. generally has to lead. If you look at the extraordinary predominance that we have in the systems that have become the coin of the realm in these fights, in particular, the 
the drones, now it's exclusively the Reaper. It used to be Predators and Reapers, which take about 150 people in total uh, to keep one eye in the sky 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the unblinking eye. Uh, and then to evaluate the intelligence, integrate it, disseminate it, make sense of it, and so forth. Um, we have probably six or seven times as many of those lines, each, this is in orbit, uh, as all of our possible allies and partners put together. D now, don't get me wrong, don't confuse these with the thousands or tens of thousands of drones that are out there, uh, everything from ones that you launch like this to, you know, some bigger ones. These are the ones that really, really matter. These are the ones that a theater commander personally allocates uh, to subordinate units, and the same as is done here in the Pentagon for the whole world. Um, those, then the industrial strength ability to fuse intelligence, uh, the enormous predominance of precision munitions and the aircraft and so forth. And keep in mind, by the way, our drones were willing to launch stuff from them in addition to all the uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance assets that we can hang off them. And very few of our allies are willing to do that or can do it uh, with the uh, ability that we have. Um, number four is you have to acknowledge a real paradox, and that is that you cannot counter terrorists like Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State with just counter-terrorist force operations. In other words, you can't just drone strike or Delta Force raid your way out of this problem. That will be necessary. And if that's all you can do, that is what you do. But you have to realize all you can do is disrupt with that. If you truly want to deal with the problem, you have to have a comprehensive approach, a, a comprehensive civil military campaign, such as the one that Ambassador Ryan Crocker and I were privileged to oversee during the surge in Iraq. But, and this is a massive but, but without us doing all of the fighting on the front lines, the restoration of basic services, the reconciliation, political reconciliation, uh, the reestablishment of rule of law and in local institutions and markets and schools and health clinics and repair of damage and everything else. And it's crucial that we not do that because of lesson number five. And that is that th this fight is not the fight of a decade, much less a few years. It is the fight of a generation or more and therefore, you have to have a sustained commitment. But we know in a democracy, you can only sustain a commitment if it's sustainable in terms of blood and treasure, the expenditure of those. There is no way we could sustain what we did in Iraq when you had 165,000 Americans and tens of thousands of coalition, plus, by the way, 200,000 or so contractors, probably. Uh, or 150,000 U.S. in coalition in Afghanistan when I was privileged to command there. Those were not sustainable. They were necessary at that time because we didn't have a lot of the assets that we have been able to bring to bear now. Uh, but we've figured out how to do this. And I think this is a hugely significant breakthrough that we are now able to carry out these kind of campaigns. I mean, in Syria, we only have about 2,000 or 2,500 troops actually on the ground. Yeah, there's a lot of other stuff above them and supporting them from various other locations. Uh, Iraq is probably, it's certainly below 6,000. It may be below 5,000 at this point. Afghanistan is, again, I don't know, 13, 14,000 Americans, several thousand more uh, coalition totally, maybe 20,000 overall. I mean, that is a hugely reduced number, therefore hugely reduced expenditure in blood and in treasure. Um, that is, I think, absolutely crucial in particular because we do have to acknowledge that the single biggest development geostrategically is, again, the rise of China. And we do need to do the rebalance uh, to Asia uh, that the previous administration initiated and this administration has continued. So I'm going to get to China, but I just want to come in on one point that you and I discussed a bit earlier. Um, for those of you who don't know me, it would be a little bit surprising that I, I would stand up for uh, the president. Um, but, you know, what I was going to say to you was, doesn't the president have, in his um, unique way, a, a kind of common sense point? You know, we've been fighting these stupid wars for 18 years. Uh, they're far away. Uh, we, you know, we smashed uh, ISIS on the ground. You know, the war in Afghanistan looks like it's going on forever. Other people have a much bigger stake in this than we do. 
not only the locals, but uh, the Europeans. Uh, why should we waste our blood and treasure about it? And the, the point that I would make is when you strip aside the, the rhetoric, which uh, doesn't appeal to um, some people, it is a kind of man in the street, person in the street, judgment about the conduct of war. And one of the things I've been hoping to draw you out on is what's the difference between that kind of judgment, and there's, there are elements of common sense to it, I think you would agree, and what you have to offer, and indeed what this school, I believe, has to offer, which is a kind of educated judgment which can take you to a different place. And I was wondering if you could ruminate a little bit on that, on the difference between sure. that, that well, sort of... Well, first of all, you know, I've sort of offered my, the five lessons, yep. and if you actually, if you sort of accept those, the policy falls out pretty, yep. and, and it would indicate that you, you know, as Ryan Crocker used to say, you can leave the movie, theater, but the movie continues to roll, and we found that out yeah. uh, the hard way, of course, after we left, pulled all our combat forces out of Iraq, um, only to find out that several years later, we had 5,500 troops on the ground. I mean, there was an irony that we removed them because we couldn't get a parliamentary approved status of forces agreement, and yet at the end of that administration, we had 5,500 troops on the ground without a parliamentary approved status of forces agreement. Um, and I'm not one who argues that had you left, had we left 5,500 troops, it would have prevented Prime Minister Maliki of Iraq from doing what he did, which is, which is basically to undo all that we'd achieved during the surge together and then sustain for a good three and a half years <clears throat> afterward, uh, with most significant of which was not actually driving the violence down by 90% and keeping it down. It was actually bringing the fabric of society back together which he tore apart, ripped apart, by going after the senior Sunni leaders, uh, he being the leader, obviously, of a Shia-majority uh, government and country. Um, so I think, and, and I should also add, look, nobody understands the frustrations of forever wars more than the individual that commanded both of them at their peak and spent you know, nearly seven of my last 10 years in uniform deployed, uh, and who, wrote more letters of condolence to America's mothers and fathers than anybody else. So at least anybody else in theater. Um, so understandably, we'd all love to leave. We'd all love to do nation building at home, as the previous administration's uh, president uh, argued. The problem is that there's these five lessons that I think are the, uh, the result, I'd like to think, of considered judgment and analysis and have become, at least for me, the big ideas when you approach this particular situation and this particular threat. Uh, and I tend to think that they are somewhat undeniable. Um, and it's in the, every time that we have denied them, actually, we have found out uh, to our disappointment or horror uh, that, well, we got to go back in and we need to keep our eye on these guys. Do, do you worry about um, the ability of people like you or me to persuade our fellow citizens of that kind of thing? Because sure. at yeah. the moment, Look. it looks as though yeah. the other kind of argument yep. is much more successful and much yep. more persuasive. Yeah. No, I mean, and, you and have what, to... how, should, how should we, particularly those of us at size, and I'm not talking about the particular... Sure argument about Iraq or Afghanistan, but more broadly, um, one of the things that seems to me we take away from this era of populism is the Dave Petraeuses of this world and the Elliot Cohen's of this world have not been particularly effective at persuading our fellow citizens to think in more or less the ways that we would like them to. Well, um, again, I think for understandable reasons, it's very easy to to argue for something that the people would like to see. Um, again, this is, I mean, this is also not akin to, let's, why don't we cut taxes? Well, what a wonderful idea. Um, yeah. You know, there is this little matter of a fiscal deficit that as a result of s recent tax cuts and also the removal of budget caps has resulted in $3.5 trillion of additional deficit spending uh, over a 10 year period. Uh, and that's additional. That's over what we already were, were planning to run. But again, that's a very appealing idea. And, and again, so how do you do it? Well, you have to try to be as persuasive as you can. I certainly tried to do that. I mean, I, I think, you know, one of my 
pluses and certainly one of my minuses in the eyes of some folks in this fair city was that I was the most accessible uh, general officer, certainly during the post 9-11 period. Um, you know, it was that then get gets you labeled a celebrity general later on, and that has its downsides when people tell you that there's room inside the beltway for only one superstar, and it's not going to be you. Um, but you know, you you live, you live with that. Uh, again, I think it is it it is the onus is on us to try to persuade people. Again, I've often said, you know, if the big ideas actually are not applauded by those to whom you unveil the big ideas or with whom you share them, uh, it actually is sometimes the case that it is the big ideas. Um, in this case, I'd like to think the big ideas are reasonably persuasive. Yeah. Uh, I have actually written about these. I mean, I have gone public with these. I did it in the Washington Post, I think, two years ago or something like that. Yeah. So, but yeah, no, this is one of the challenges. Is how, in an age of populism, in an age of how many characters is in a tweet, I'm not on Twitter, I must confess. I have people that send me stuff on Twitter, but. Um, you know, it, it, you have to be able to compete with those who are really good at that. Uh, but how do you counter some of the challenges of uh, the social media age, uh, which we're only beginning to see now when it comes to, you know, the, the fake videos that are going to be produced that are getting ever more uh, believable, the deep fakes and so forth, and they're ever more refined and, and, and again, realistic. Uh, it's going to take a huge effort. Um, I'll tell you that when we were doing the surge in Iraq, uh, we put an enormous effort uh, into our communication strategy. Now the big idea, and we had a whole series of big ideas for, we had three pages of counterinsurgency guidance, which I actually wrote personally and edited every month or two, and I just hit the send key uh, during that 19 and a half month period. But one of the big ideas when it came to dealing with the press was be first with the truth. That's pretty profound. You want to beat the bad guys to the headline, be first. And by the way, keep in mind that the bad guys have CNN's Baghdad Bureau speed dialed in their cell phone. Uh, and as you're fighting your way out of Sadr City or Delta is or something like that, they're already dialing in uh, and saying the Americans have just committed an atrocity. We're fighting to get the full motion video pulled down to race it over to them or send it to them to show that, no, these guys shot first. We can show you this. Let us explain it to you. And so don't do the headline until we at least have a chance to talk to you, because you want that headline. You don't want to be the one that, underneath it that says Americans say not an atrocity. You want it to be Americans conduct operation to seize uh, Shia militia leader or what have you. Um, and then with the truth, and you, and you, know, you cannot, um, you know, if you lie to the press, it will, it will come back yeah. to bite you in the backside. And we had individuals that found it very difficult actually to go up to the podium uh, and explain what actually took place that day and instead would start off by giving happy talk. And I said, you know, the 160 people were killed in the bazaars today in, the, in these Baghdad, uh, these huge, you know, their version of a shopping mall or center was just a huge street a mile long, as you'll recall, within back streets. And there were three suicide bombers one day, and, and again, our spokesman, uh, who wore stars, uh, went out and started by talking about the resumption of the soccer league and that the amusement park was coming back. Yeah, we had these, this terrible experience. I said, no, you go out, you say, we had a horrible day today in Baghdad. 160 innocent civilians were killed uh, in horrendous, horrific uh, suicide bombings. Here's what we understand to have taken place. Here's what we have sat down with our Iraqi counterparts to, to, to initiate, to try to mitigate the risks of that in the future. Uh, and this is in more details to follow. So again, you, you have to really get serious about that. We had people watching the televisions there full time. We had people watching print media and that day's version of social media, which was still just developing, 24 by 7, every one of them so that you could immediately push back. It has to be a war room kind of operation. We also had a very substantial UK uh, public relations firm working for us. Uh, we made our own videos and, and so forth. Uh, again, these were realistic. These were not, uh, you know, happiness in the midst of what was going on. So let me, I'm just going to ask you two more questions because I know lots of people here want to ask you things. Um, first question is about China. You've mentioned that China, China, China. Um, 
obviously China is both a competitor to the United States um, and, and a critical uh, partner, but also a, a global force. Uh, and you know, I've begun talking about the arrival of China rather than the rise of China because it's risen. It's, it's already here. Yep. Um, what I'd like to ask you is to put on your analytic hat rather than your policy hat. So not, not talk about what you think American policy should be, but how do you see this pattern of relationships playing out over the next decade or so? What, what do you think the relationship is likely to look like rather than what you think the United States should be doing about it? Well, as a former economics professor, obviously, I should begin this by saying it depends. Um, and <laughs> then you're that, supposed to say on the one hand. Uh, on the one hand, uh, no, it does depend. I mean, it depends yeah. on, on what Chinese leaders are willing to do. Um, it depends what American leaders uh, are going to be willing to do. Uh, it depends on the strategic relationship between our two countries. I mean, I think we desperately need true strategic dialogue. Uh, the kind that a Henry Kissinger would, would be carrying out. Uh, but it's difficult if people are changing jobs fairly frequently. So uh, it does depend very, very much on all of these different dynamics. I, I do, I should note up front, I have to say something, I think, about what our foreign policy should be, because I've written about this as well. There's a monograph up at the Belfer Center at Harvard. It's titled Coherence, or Coherence and Comprehensiveness, colon, an American foreign policy imperative. And it argues that what we should have for China uh, is a very coherent approach. It's very clear that that's the number one priority. Uh, everything else, therefore, is not the main effort. They're all supporting efforts to use military parlance. Uh, it should be comprehensive, not just all of our <coughs> possible tools, not just, of course, military, trade, economic, diplomatic, uh, social, you name it, all of that but all of that from all of our possible partners and allies as well, uh, it would contend, I think, you would conclude that, that you would not pull out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership as an example. Some shortcomings, sure, and, and I got it that mm -hmm. the other candidate ran against it as well after she'd promoted it for four years as Secretary of State, but I'm quite confident there would have been a finesse to get back to it because that was much more important geostrategically than it was actually economically. Um, you would certainly point out to your NATO partners that they're not spending 1.5% in one case, much less 2% of GDP on defense, uh, even though that one of them is running a fiscal surplus. Um, but, you know, you have to limit that because you need all these NATO allies with you. You need all your Asia-Pacific allies even more so. If you want to truly make the Indo-Pacific a reality and not just a new name for an old headquarters, uh, again, you've got to take steps to, to truly operationalize that. You want all the G7 countries with you. So, again, be careful how you, yeah. uh, again, uh, interact with but them at G7. Do you G7 think this meetings. is going to be a more conflictual relationship in the future? Well, again, that truly does depend on, on both sides. Uh, again, there are legitimate issues very clearly on the U.S. side, and they have accumulated over time. By the way, let me say up front, I, again, very much want to see this be a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, but in recent years in particular, I think there, has, there have been more concerns here. And my hope is that, again, there can be some reestablishment of some degree of trust and confidence so that at least it doesn't turn into an all-out Cold War. We are already, I would contend, in the early stages of a tech Cold War. I think that is actually happening, and I think that probably is going to follow through. I think there's just too many realities there. Um, look, there is not a World Wide Web anymore. There's 1.3 billion people who are behind the Great Firewall of China. There will be more of these. Russia will uh, adopt uh, Chinese technology and so forth. And again, so there will be countries that will not take it uh, and take ours or Western. There will be countries that will take it, um, and there will be then probably a fracturing of the World Wide Web further and of the IT space, if you will, as well. Uh, and then there'll be some in between somehow that, yeah. that will try to, to, to keep it again. The challenges particularly for uh, those countries that are heavily dependent on trade, uh, their biggest trading partner 
in many cases, is China. In some cases, their biggest security partner is the United yeah. States. So they're in a difficult situation here. Uh, and so again, it really does depend on decisions that are made uh, and on relationships uh, that are pursued at what is quite a fragile time for the, for the particular relationship. I'm not certain that we're going to resolve all of the issues uh, that are listed in the U.S. Trade Representatives list, of, which is quite a comprehensive list of issues. There's a bigger issue here, though, as well, and I think there's a, a maybe one of the biggest of the big ideas about the, the world today is that we have the return of history. So history, it turns out, didn't actually end with Francis Fukuyama's brilliant essay in 1989 in a little journal called The National Interest, which had only 10,000 subscribers at the time. Two of them are on the stage here with you. Um, it, you know, it was a brilliant essay, wonderfully argued. You'll recall that his argument that history is the dialectic or the competition intellectual between contending systems. And you had this US-led Western democratically elected governance, liberal democracy, if you will, and capitalist economics, free market economics, and competing with the uh, Soviet Union and its system uh, and partners in the Warsaw Pact, but in particular the Soviet uh, Communist Party and the command economy of the Soviet Union at the time. And he predicted quite rightly, uh, presciently, that this was going to collapse of its own weight. It did much sooner than I think most people yeah. Uh, assessed would be the case. Um, he also, I think, has confessed more recently that history is back and it's back with a vengeance. And this one over here, this is a meritocratic one-party system that has enabled China to achieve results economically that no country has ever remotely approached, at least any large economy, uh, in a 40-year period. I mean, it's just spectacular what they have accomplished. Uh, and that's their system of governance, and they have a hyper-competitive free market economy, albeit with an ecosystem that includes substantial state-owned enterprises in which investment now is once again uh, being placed. But that's up against the U.S.-led liberal democracies of the world, many of which are experiencing a variety of, of populism. Uh, all the major democracies, I would contend, with the exception perhaps of Japan, you can argue India, but, yeah. but certainly the U.S., the U.K., Germany, France, Spain, Italy, and on. Uh, all of these, again, experiencing very considerable elements of populism in their... In their I'm going to ask you one last question, sure. um, and then we'll open it up. Um, I want to get back to your idea of strategic leadership. And it, it seemed to me that you know, your point about that kind of leadership, as opposed to the many other kinds of leadership that are out there, uh, is that it begins with the big ideas. <clears throat> and the, I think retrospectively, the big ideas look pretty simple and pretty straightforward, okay? And that- Once somebody has them. Right, so, so th that, and that's exactly what I wanted to get at I because- mean, everybody after the surge said, well, of course you had well, to do exactly, what you were doing. So, okay, so this is- Well, except that obviously by right, right. So those it, who came this, before me opposed it. This is exactly- And what, even those who were on top of me, with the exception once you got to Gates and Bush, thankfully, but you know this was not universally right. welcomed. Even and when it came to some of the more controversial of the big guy, I think everybody realized at a certain point, certainly on the ground, look, we have to improve security. You can't have 53 dead civilian bodies due to violence every 24 hours in the capital of Iraq and expect that anything uh, useful is going to be conducted in the parliament and in the schools and in the, all the rest of this. So, so, so you had to do that. Uh, but again, we weren't doing it. Right, so, so um, here, here's my question. As I said, I mean, this is the way in which, one of the ways in which history yep. can be very distorting. We, we know how it turned out. So the, the ideas which are, um, in, in one sense, simple. This isn't like studying Hegel. I mean, you can, you can articulate these in a way that a 19-year-old sure. can understand. Why is it so hard in prospect? Why does it take somebody like you uh, or you know, pick some other successful strategic leader to actually come up with ideas that in retrospect we say, well, yeah, that's pretty straightforward. Why, why is it hard? Because there's bureaucratic inertia, momentum, what have you. The people who are leading are sort of invested in what they're doing. 
I mean, ask Kodak, which had thousands, not just hundreds, thousands of digital uh, photography patents, why they didn't change the big ideas when they did. Uh, it, it, they didn't actually, and of course they're out of business. Uh, so again, it, it, by the way, it's not enough just to get the big ideas right, as I mentioned, and communicate them and oversee them. You actually have to, again, I think formally sit down and force yourself to ask, how do we refine the big ideas? So in my battle rhythm as the commander in Iraq or in Afghanistan for that matter, at least one hour every month, uh, all of the lessons learned teams, there were colonels that led the Army, Marine, Special Ops, Asymmetric Warfare Group, Counterinsurgency Center, all these different teams all over the battlefield, and they would report in, and that was just one source of sort of intellectual challenge uh, for me, then sitting down with the planners, they were another source, or a variety of other uh, activities that we called action forcing mechanisms. Um, but the fact is that, look, you you don't get hit on the head by Newton's apple fully formed if you find the right tree to sit under. Uh, more likely, you get hit on the head by the kernel of a big idea, um, and you have to shape it. And, and that shaping process generally is best done uh, in an inclusive way, uh, a welcoming way. You want everybody feeling that at least they have an opportunity to contribute. You want people inside the tent uh, rather than you know what people do if they're outside the tent. Um, and it's generally iterative, and it, again, it really should it be something that continues. Again, I mentioned the counterinsurgency guidance that I had in Iraq, and I had another set for Afghanistan. This was dynamic. I mean, it wasn't revolutionary change, but I would capture a new way of phrasing something. I mean, one of the big ideas was walk. <laughs> Get out of your vehicle and walk. Another was take off your sunglasses. Um, there was one that said, promote initiative, and it explained, we want leaders who feel that in the absence of guidance or orders, they figure out what they should have done and execute aggressively. Um, you know, this is what you want. Um, so how do you create, again, that kind of culture, that kind of organ? We wanted to have a learning organization. In the counterinsurgency field manual, I wrote in the preface or whatever that uh, the side that learns the fastest typically prevails. So you've got to promote that. You have to force that. You have to drive it, by the way, as a strategic leader. You know, you'd like this to appear, and I worked really hard at the CIA, for example, to make it appear, you know, this is very easy, and I just have a light hand on the reins, and, you know, if I fell asleep and didn't wake up for two days, nobody would even notice um, all of that. The truth is you're still driving a campaign. Uh, in the surge in Iraq where we're under such a pressure of time where we had to have results in six months or there was an actual possibility that there would be a cloture vote in the Senate that would circumscribe some of our resources or uh, authorities. Um, so there we, you have to just drive this uh, personally very much. Uh, but again, you're conveying all of that. So, but big ideas in hindsight always appear terrific. Um, they don't when you're actually going through them. I'll give you an example. I, I love the example of Reed Hastings and Netflix. I think he's one of the great strategic leaders of the world. Jeff Bezos certainly would be another. Jack Ma uh, of Alibaba would be another, the founder of Xiaomi in China. These are really extraordinary people who have been almost unerring in how they've gone about it. So Netflix sat down in the beginning and after Blockbuster foolishly didn't buy them, I didn't, you know, there's a little story. They actually went and offered Blockbuster, you can buy us for, I don't know, $50 million or something like that. They turned them down. So the first big idea is we're going to put movies in the hands of customers without brick and mortar like Blockbuster, and we're going to put Blockbuster out of business. So that's the big idea. They communicate it, figure out how to do it, oversee the execution get down here, and by the way, I've talked with uh, Reed Hastings. He has mechanisms that are very similar to this, not precisely. And so he gets down here and said, oh, two years later, okay, how are we doing? Well, it's going great. Blockbuster actually is going out of business. Test question, where is the last Blockbuster? There's two, actually. <laughs> big, big Bend, Oregon, which is a famously contrarian place and refuses to let its blockbuster die. And then there is one up in Alaska somewhere as well, as I learned when I was in Juneau the other day. Uh, anyway, so he gets down here and, and says, so, you know, it's going great. They're going out of business, but now others are doing, so what do we do now? 
And so the new big idea was that, well, broadband speeds are now faster. We can have them download content. So that's the new big idea. They communicate it, oversee it, get down here. Terrific, everybody else is doing that. What do we do now? Well, let's develop our own content. $100 million on House of Cards, uh, Breaking Bad, all these other great, great series that everybody in here has been for watch, except for Elliot. Um, <laughs> I watched House of Cards. He only reads nonfiction. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so they, the new, you know, so they say, okay, get down here, how's that going? Oh, it's going fantastically well. Um, but what do we do now? Because now Amazon and HBO, everybody's producing content. So they decided, well, let's go out and buy some movie studios. We're going to produce blockbuster movies. Um, so they do. And, you know, the first one was that one that had Brad Pitt playing Stan McChrystal. And it was horrible um, for a whole variety <laughs> of reasons. I mean, number one, Stan has a sense of humor. Brad Pitt, I think, I mean, it has to be the most forgettable role he ever had. Not, not Stan, but... He marched around like this, and you know they were always doing these crazy things that people imagine military do. They really don't. Um, I mean, the other I was also sort of devastated that Brad Pitt didn't hold out to play me. But you know, I, mean, <laughs> um, I had you know the great Australian actor from um, from Gladiator. Uh, with, yes. Uh, anyway, so but that's you get the idea on strategic leadership. This again, these all appear obvious in hindsight, but they weren't uh, until they arrived. I mean, the counterinsurgency field manual, everybody said, oh, well, of course, this is all common sense. I said, well, then why are we doing what we're doing? Right. I heard, uh, why did that. we miss the impact of this escalation of Sunni Shia violence in the wake of the bombing of the Samara Mosque in February 2006, and it just goes like this, and we continue to withdraw from the communities, continue to hand off to the Iraqis, uh, and continue to posture to go home. So again, it, it, that's the process with big ideas. Great. Let's okay, I've been uh, I've been going on way too long. Right over there, I'm going to ask. So here's here's the thing. I'm going to ask uh, people to rise. Wait for, wait for the microphone. Yep. Yeah, stand, stand up. Um, say who you are, what your affiliation is, and actually ask a question. So don't worry. That's I'm like a with a question mark at the end. Right. Okay. My name's Aliyah oh. Awadallah. I'm a second year strategic studies concentrator at SAIS. Thank you for being with us tonight. I wanted to ask you about Africa. As sure. you know, East Africa has become an arena of uh, extremism and also competition between great powers, Gulf countries and Turkey. Yep. And I see a lot of parallels to the competition that's taken place in the Middle East over the past few decades. I wanted to ask how you think the U.S. should respond to or engage in this competition and how we can do better than we've done in the Middle East in recent years. Thank you. Well, look, I think we should engage more. I mean, I, I am heartened to see the International Development Finance Corporation, which is going to be called DFC, I think is the acronym, uh, and more importantly, to see the amount of resources doubled from 30 million, uh, which used to be to 60 billion, or 60 billion. Uh, that's heartening, uh, but then they should also obviously coordinate with the other major donors, uh, Japan, the EU, and others, uh, so that you increase the effect. Once again, it's a place to have a coherent and comprehensive approach, noting that this will not be the main effort, which is, again, going to be with respect to China. Uh, but this is actually a competition, by the way, with, uh, with China there as well, and again, it, it isn't uh, an area of great power competition, once again. Uh, it is an area where there are Islamist extremists. Um, it's an area where there's a variety of other challenges, uh, whether it's inadequate governance, uh, corruption, lack of rule of law, or, or what have you. So again, all of that, I think, augurs for uh, the kind of approach that we've used in the past. But it doesn't mean that you have to be in conflict with China all the time. I mean, that. It, I think is the the big takeaway, and to realize that we're obviously in a nuclear age as well. Uh, so I love Graham Allison's book, and he's a huge mentor of mine up at the Kennedy School. Uh, destined for war, without a question mark. Uh, you know, can China and the U.S. avoid Thucydides' trap? But all of those cases actually are sort of mostly are pre-nuclear age, and uh, I think the stakes are quite a bit different, to put it mildly. But again, I think the the you know ninety percent of success is just showing up, and we really haven't been showing up in all of these different locations. Uh, it, it's very very frustrating. I will acknowledge. And there were a 
there were moments where, as the CI director, we literally had to shut down a program or two because the lack of integrity on the part of uh, host nation forces or what have you was so disturbing and the risk to our operators was so significant. But you've got to, got to work through that. We did do the biggest investment in Africa. Uh, I think it was four or five years ago at KKR. We bought the biggest rose grower, cut rose grower in the entire world in Ethiopia. All of my West Point classmates thought I'd lost my mind, that I was excited about growing roses in Africa. But it employed, at the end of it, it went from something like 8,000 or 9,000 Ethiopians to, I think, 12 or 13,000 at the end. So you can do uh, some very substantial investments and in other activities there. Uh, but again, you've got to have a little bit of a strong stomach for some of the challenges that you're going to encounter. So right over there. Oh. Right over there, blue tie. No, no, a little bit forward. Come up. There he is. Blue shirt and blue yeah, tie. Yeah, blue shirt, blue tie. Sure. Oh, General Petrolius, uh, I'm Ida, second year from China. I've read a lot of work uh, of you when I was in China, and it's really great to see you here. And uh, although I basically, I, I work on the Middle East and I'm thinking of this kind of relationship between China and the US in the Middle East for a, lo a long time. But I think my question today is about the basic science competition between China and the US. Uh, from what I saw when I came to the US, I find that American students' quantitative skills are not that strong vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese students. Uh, if you look into the TA of size, you'll find many of them are actually not from the U.S. Uh, but, but, but uh, I mean, having this kind of basic science is extremely important in uh, having the innovation yep. in terms of technology in the future. Mm -hmm. So my question is how U.S., uh, what's your ideas on how U.S. can cultivate the smartest scientists on basic science? and how to attract the smartest minds sure. all around the world in the sure. US. Okay, I just have to uh, interrupt. Uh, Please. A Hopkins professor just won the Nobel Prize, so we're, we're, we're still generating a, a few. <laughs> but okay, now, now you can go Blue Jays. Okay, no, yeah. It's, it's actually a very good question. I'm you know, fairly serious about STEM topics and all the rest of this. Uh, we do a quite a bit of investing in a variety of different technical areas, technology areas. I'm a personal venture capitalist as well, invest, invested in 15 startups, um, one of which is, a, is already over a billion dollars, which is really exciting, and it happens to be in AI. Um, so again, I'm pretty keenly focused on this. The, as always, you have to have a comprehensive approach. Um, we have to do a better job in the U.S. of make, making STEM cool. Uh, of making people believe that this is something that they should want to do. Uh, obviously, there are issues with some public schools that we need to address. I think it's not, not wrong to argue that we're leaving 40% of uh, America's students behind to some degree uh, with some of the challenges that we have in some of the public school areas. Uh, I think you, we need to continue to provide student visas uh, to attract the world's best and brightest, and then we need to work really, really hard to keep them here. Uh, and there have been steps that we've taken to make both of those uh, difficult. And then also we should lift the limit of H-1B visas, uh, which are the smart people visas. So I, I'm a huge believer in comprehensive immigration reform. That means a legal pathway for unskilled workers who are vital to our agriculture, construction, hospitality sectors, among others. Uh, more H-1B visas, because our techni technical firms in Silicon Valley and Silicon Alley and Silicon Beach, and that's LA, we've worked on that one too, and Silicon Hills and Austin and others all depend on those. Uh, and then, uh, again, making it easy to keep the people here. You know, I've argued that if somebody's coming to a STEM uh, technology program and going to get a PhD, there should be a green card stapled to the acceptance letter. Uh, that certainly should be the case if they're accepted at Hopkins and MIT and <laughs> perhaps even Harvard, maybe even Princeton. Above all uh, Hopkins. So, yeah. no. But, so, again, I think you've got to have a very, very comprehensive approach to this. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of areas in which we have not taken some of the steps that I've just outlined. In fact, we've taken a little bit the other approach to that. 
Lady over here. Thanks for limiting it to just one We're, person at a time. I know. We, yeah, one at a time. We'll, I think we'll probably yeah. take two more questions. Okay. People are not leaving in disgust. They're, they've got six o'clock classes and they're being dutiful. <laughs> Please. Um, my name is Graciela Marino. I'm a first year uh, conflict management concentrator. And I wanted to learn about your read on what will happen in the short, medium term in Venezuela and specifically um, about investment sure. um, prospects and risks because I've talked to a lot of Americans who want to start investing right, right now. And then I think yeah. after this, we'll take one more question. Sure. I mean, it certainly would be wise to prepare for the moment when investment is possible again in Venezuela. I mean, obviously right now for a whole variety of reasons, not the least of which are sanctions, uh, a, a colossally bad investment environment, to put it mildly, and a variety of other challenges, the corruption, and I mean serious corruption, and, uh, illegal activity by the, the rulers of the country. Uh, I think, I fear that what is going to have to happen in Venezuela is that the country is going to have to collapse. Um, I just, I do not see a path to a negotiated outcome when you have a regime that has, it's, this is a kleptocratic regime that, it, this is not just Saddam Hussein and his son Zuday and Kusay and a handful of other, you know, bath level one and two members. This is an entire regime, the entire military superstructure. Every element of that society, as you know far better than I, unfortunately is tied into this. And much of it is highly illegal. Uh, there's serious issues with uh, illegal narcotics trafficking and every other possible activity that can generate hard currency for a regime that is being slowly strangled by sanctions. And again, I think it's highly unlikely that they're going to give up power. This is not a situation, again, where you can fly into Haiti and tell the strong man, you know, you leave, and in, or Panama, where you get rid of, uh, of, of the leader and everybody else is sort of okay. You can keep them around and just turn them in a slightly different direction. There's vastly more there than all of these others put together. And so my fear is, again, that it actually has to collapse and then, we need to be ready very, very quickly uh, to provide a lot of different, first of all, humanitarian assistance, and it may then require a lot of other forms of assistance as well, beyond economic. Last question right over here. <clears throat> Any person who has the guts to wear a red pocket square <laughs> is... I had the guts to rebel against the Iranian government. This is nothing. Uh, Sheikh Yatiri, uh, second year strategic studies student and fellow Hamilton Society member. Uh, my question is that recently Business Roundtable put out a statement for the purpose of a corporation that said, broke with the libertarian orthodoxy and said that the purpose of a corporation is more than yeah. maximizing profit. You dedicated your life to public good, and now you are at a corporation. And my question is that, especially with now that some there are some grievances with corporations such as Google, which are doing business with Chinese Communist Party. Uh, how do you, if uh, if you agree with that statement, how do you, as a now in private sector, navigate between what's public good and uh, maximization of profit for the shareholders? Mm. Yeah, that's a fairly complex issue, and we had some good debates about that at KKR. We have long believed, I should note up front, uh, in doing well while doing good. In other words, obviously you have to get good returns or people are not going to give you uh, their money to manage. By the way, a lot of this is pension funds. This is, you know, millions of people, uh, money from all around the world uh, entrusted to us, uh, and we see this as a very sacred obligation. So this is not just all high net worth individuals by any means. This is the retirement services, the, the uh, probably the endowments uh, are another big source. Sovereign wealth funds are certainly another one. So this is a serious responsibility. You've got to get great returns, but we are quite committed to doing that while doing good. And good means, again, that you uh, don't break the law, don't foul the environment, don't violate some social norm, what, what have you. And we believe this for two reasons. One, we think that's the right thing to do. Uh, we also think that it's the wise thing to do from a business perspective. By the way, I make the same case with enhanced interrogation techniques. I truly believe they were wrong. 
I understand why they took place. I firmly do. I was inside that uh, special ops communications network uh, at the time. I was deployed in Bosnia uh, on 9-11. But again, I, I really think they are wrong. I also think that they don't work that well. Um, but even if you dismiss those, um, I'd argue that the price you're going to pay for whatever it is you might actually get by using those will vastly outweigh uh, the value of what you have. So again, um, if you don't do good, eventually you're not going to do well. By the way, we're actually running an impact fund now. It's, it's well over a billion dollars, still climbing, where the intent is to do good while still doing well. So, but keep in mind that you know, there are responsibilities to a variety of different stakeholders. And we have actually had lots and lots of, I mean, when you get into the eaches of this, this starts to get quite serious. Uh, should a sporting goods store sell automatic weapons? Uh, or semi or uh, assault weapons? Should it sell high capacity magazines? Um, there's lots and lots of these different eaches, and they have to be weighed against the various stakeholders who are all affected by this. I mean, it may be that you make less profit, it may be you may actually make more. People re reward a company for doing what might be seen as the right thing, and they actually do better. So, Again, I think this is going to play out. There's going to be still a lot of debate about what does this actually mean? Uh, how do you operationalize this? And I can tell you that's already ongoing. Uh, again, in a firm that owns 100 large companies around the world uh, and has, again, a minority stake in some 50 to 70 others. Many of those that you know and use, uh, again, on a very regular basis, you'll find out that I actually believe in what we do. I actually like the concept of investing not just money, but also expertise and assistance and insight and all the rest of that uh, to help something grow, to build value, uh, ultimately then to obviously return uh, more to our investors than they provided to us. Um, but there's lots of debates about the, again, as I said, how do you operationalize that big idea, which I think has a lot of merit, but you've got to be careful because, again, there are a variety of different responsibilities that you have, uh, not just to uh, shareholders, to investors, uh, but to a number of other stakeholders as well. And so there's, that's one, once again, where you have to have a comprehensive approach. Look, let me just end by saying thanks so much uh, to my favorite dean of SICE uh, and someone I've long hoped would be a dean of this school at some point in time, and it really is wonderful to see him in that capacity. Uh, to know that you've learned, lured Dan Marsden uh, away to join, and he's leading a great strategic <coughs> studies program uh, as well, and I look forward to a lot of other initiatives that I know that you're going to pursue uh, as the strategic leader of this great institution. So thank you all very much. Dave, thank you.